But I'm gonna got it. Uh, now I just have to figure out something here. I just before we start the formal part of our workshop, I'd just like to take a minute for all of us to reflect on the fact that we are here in um, Nogo Jigwanong and want to very respectfully acknowledge that the land on which EC3 and all of the artists located in Peterborough work is the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe, home to the Williams Treaty's First Nations, who have been the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters for countless generations. We are very grateful to be here, and we pledge to listen and learn from the traditional knowledge and ways of the Indigenous people of this area to support them in their ongoing work, and um, which they continue to this day to preserve the lands and waters. And we also want to say that EC3 is committed to doing all we can to further meaningful efforts at truth and reconciliation. And that includes providing support to the artistic work of Indigenous artists, examining the ways that we do this, and providing a space and a platform for their voices to be heard. So thank you very much, and we're very grateful to be here. So tonight we're gathered to talk about the Grants for Individual Artists program. This is a program funded primarily by the City of Peterborough, so we want to thank them very much. We have a three-year contract with the city for $50,000 a year. Um, we do have some other money that we're able to put into the program, but it would not be possible without the uh, support of the City of Peterborough. So EC3 designs the program, we deliver the program, we choose the jury. We'll talk a little bit more about juries and peer assessments um, in a little bit later. Um, the focus of the program is on providing financial support to individual artists. So your work as a creator is what's, what is the most important thing in this program. You have to be a professional artist, and we'll talk about the definition of professional artists a little bit later in the presentation. And it can be, um, there are two, two components to this program. So you can be involved in research, development, exploration in component one at $1,500, or you can apply to component two for the production and presentation of actual projects. Gabe, I'm having... Just funny, something funny is in the way of the bottom of the slide, but um, not quite sure what it is. Click if you want to switch to a different microphone. No, I don't. I just want you to, there we go. This program strives to support applications that reflect and promote the cultural diversity of Peterborough and Canada today. And we welcome application from artists in equity seeking communities. So in Peterborough, that has tended to be defined by BIPOC communities, two S LGBTQ plus communities, and also communities of artists who are deaf or hard of hearing or who have physical disabilities um, of any kind. So I think that's the Good introduction slide. So one of the things we're really excited about and proud of in this program is that there are the two components. One is very open-ended, component one, mini development grants for individual professional artists. That's a grant up to $1,500, and it really allows the artist to do preparation, exploration, research, professional development. You can work with a mentor. You can workshop a play or a piece of choreographic work. And it's a smaller amount of money to just help you find some time or if you have artist fees for other artists as well as for yourself to, you know, develop a project. And component two is much more focused on production and presentation grants. And that's a grant of up to $3,500. In component one, you don't have to have a final project that you end up presenting 
to the public. In component two, you are expected to have a final project that is presented to the public. Um, you can only apply to one component of the program each year. Is everybody okay on those basics? Yeah, okay. So the first one, component one, um, as I said, it's a grant of up to $1,500. You have to be a professional artist and you have to take um, undertake a program of activities that the jury is persuaded is really going to help your creative research and development, help you be more innovative and su support the sustainability or development of your practice. So then we have a long list of things that in this is, I guess, really the third year of us doing the program. We had a pilot year and then year one of the um, three-year commitment from the city. So there are some clear things that we saw in juries and that we heard from our board and our advisory committee. So this is just a list of potential things. Um, I'm not gonna read them all out to you, but any of these areas are eligible in component one. Artists have applied for all of them and been successful in getting grants for all of them. So I'll just pause for a minute because we're not a, a big group. Does anybody have questions on what is eligible or do you have something in, in your mind that you wanna do and you're wondering if component one would support it? You can, you can ask me now. If you're good, just give me a thumbs up and we'll go on. Okay, I think we can go go on. Thanks, Gabe. As I mentioned, while component one projects may include presentation of a completed work or works, it's not a requirement. This is a truly um, a development grant. We've certainly seen people come in for a development grant in one competition to workshop or build a play, for example, then they come back into component two the next year and actually complete the play and do a public presentation of it. There are some things which are not eligible in component one or component two. So I just want to clarify those. Curatorial projects, teaching projects, or starting a new business are not eligible for funding in this program. These are really focused on creative activities from professional artists. Thanks, Gabe. Second component is project production and presentation grants. This grant provides a maximum of up to $3,500 for individual artists for creation, making the work, production, building the work, and presentation, exhibiting, performing, disseminating, distributing the work in some way. It can be a brand new work or it can be a work in progress. It can take place live in Peterborough or it can be virtual. And you can do it anytime over the next two years. You can't come back into the program though until your project's finished and you've completed a report. Oh, there's Naomi Duval is here. I love doing these. It's like old home week. Okay. I think we're into component two now. So when we're thinking about project production and pre presentation grants for individual artists, the projects can take place at any location within the city or county. That includes Hiawatha and Curved Lake First Nations. Um, it can be new or established indoor venues, outdoor spaces, mobile activities, broadcast, narrowcast, banners, billboards, flags, publications. Any of those things are eligible in component two. It can include um, the production of CDs, streaming events, and live performance. And again, curatorial projects, teaching projects, 
or people wanting to start a new business are not eligible for um, this particular grant. Thanks, Gabe. So while of this component two is a grant to an individual professional artist, um, artists can work and still be eligible in this program as part of a collective of an ad hoc group um, with established arts organizations, um, as long as the individual artist applying retains creative control of the project. So I'll give you a couple of examples. We've had people who want to do a big production, a promenade type of production or some kind of a performance production. It's their work, it's their piece, but they take a very collective approach to creation. That is definitely eligible. The jury will want to see that the artist is paying uh, fees to the other artists involved and that they have full creative control. This weekend, for example, on Sunday at the Art Gallery of Peterborough, there's a project, a dance project by um, an artist, a visual artist who came into the program, but he commissioned, he wanted to commission dancers to do a performance piece that was part of his overall exhibition project at the AGP. So he maintained creative control over that project, worked collectively with the dancers and the choreographers, and then that was part of the art gallery's overall programming. That was definitely eligible and was ranked very highly by the jury. Um, so as you can see in point two, partnerships and collaborations with other community organizations are welcome and they're encouraged. It often gives you a kind of stable infrastructure to work with and allows you to reach a bigger audience or you can just be working on your own. Whatever makes sense for you in the current state of your creative practice. Also wanna say that the duration of the project is very open. We've seen people apply and be successful with pop-up projects, things that happen one time, things that are a series, uh, exhibitions that go on for months, plays that play for uh, you know several evenings. Um, the duration is really, really flexible. Absolutely, artist fees must be paid, and you'll see in the budget forms how that gets sorted out in your application. Okay. Okay, so the eligibility criteria as an individual artist are the same for both components one and two, and you um, have to meet the following basic criteria. You have to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, which are federally assigned um, statuses, statuses, hmm. uh, or persons upon whom refugee protection has been conferred. You have to be legally entitled to work in Ontario. You have to be a resident of the city of Peterborough or the county, and that includes Hiawatha and First Lake and Curve Lake. You have to be a professional artist. We'll come to the definition of that. You have to be 18 years of age or over. And you have to have completed and submitted all outstanding reports from any previous EC3 grant. Uh, Gabe will be getting in touch with people um, who apply that haven't submitted their report. And we'll give you a little bit of grace time to get that final report in. But unless the report is in and approved, you, you aren't eligible. So professional artists, there's often disputes and questions about what's a professional artist. So EC3 did a lot of best practice research when we were developing this program and our kind of final encapsulated definition is the one that you see on the screen there. So you don't have to have gone to college or university, um, but you have to have a track record of developing your skills through training or practice. You have to be recognized by artists working in the same artistic tradition um, and be able to demonstrate that to the jury. And you have to have a history of public presentation of some kind or publication for at least a year. You have to actively seek payment for your work and you have to be actively practicing your art. 
Very important to acknowledge, I think, that short breaks in artistic history are, or, sorry, work history are completely acceptable. We know that a lot of people uh, may, you might get sick, you might travel, you might have children. There might be all kinds of reasons why there's a break in your artistic work history. That's quite acceptable, but the jury will be looking um, in your application and in your biography and your CV of a consistent commitment to your practice. Student projects, projects undertaken as part of any kind of course credit are not eligible in this program. You can be a student, you can apply for a grant, but not if it's part of your course credit. So there are some expenses that are ineligible um, and primarily they're related to capital expenditures for items that will have significant value after the project that you're applying for is over. Um, and we've given you some examples of these. You can apply to rent equipment. You can apply to, um, well, you'll see the eligible expenses in, in, in a minute, but these are things that are not eligible and you don't want to put them in your budget because it'll confuse the jury or we will ask you to remove them before we even put the proposal in front of the jury. Okay. So we have had over the last couple of years, really interesting project proposals from artists who wanna work with vulnerable communities. So that can be everything from children, people living with mental illness, at severe dis economic disadvantage, seniors. Um, there is a, a definition um, with uh, the Ontario Arts Council and with the Human Rights Commission of vulnerable communities. So if you're going to be working with people in any of those communities, we will require that you submit a police vulnerable check, sector check, a PVSC, um, for, your, for yourself or if you're gonna be working with other artists and then people from vulnerable communities, everybody in your project has to have one of these checks before we can release the grant funds. Um, we'll ask for proof. They issue a certificate. And and I think it costs, doesn't it cost $50, Gabe? I sort of forget. But we will cover the cost of that in, a, in addition to your basic grant requirement. Okay. So a lot of people ask us, what's peer assessment? Who decides who gets the grants? So... One of the first things I want to say is that the staff of EC3, the board of EC3, has no role in deciding who gets the grants. In a jury, our role is to make sure the jury runs well, that it's fair, that it's transparent, that every peer on the jury gets a fair opportunity to speak, and that the jury's work stays strictly to the published um, assessment criteria. So this is a long-standing tradition in Canada and many other parts, particularly of the British Commonwealth, but the idea is that it, you should be judged by your peers, just as you are in a criminal court case, in principle, judged by your peers. But in giving out grants, we can be a little more focused so the jury is a decision-making group and they're all going to be artists or arts professionals. There'll be a wide variety of expertise on the jury and the, it can include artists, it can include arts educators, curators, and managers. Really critical to the composition of the jury is who's in the competition. And this might be the first time I've said the word competition, but we always like to remind artists that you are competing against a number of other people. So typically, I'm trying to remember, we probably have about 30 applicants, uh, maybe more in, in, a comp in a competition. So one of the things that Gabe and I will do when the deadline has passed and all of the application eligible applications have been assessed as we'll do an analysis of who is in that competition. 
And we'll choose jurors that know that practice, that know that community, that have a diverse gender, racial, age, diverse in terms of whether they're emerging artists or senior artists, so that we feel like there's uh, five jury members usually, that this is a good representation of people who are going to be able to make thoughtful, well-informed and fair decisions about who gets the grants. We do also look for people who we know have knowledge, insight, analytical skills, and again, the, the blend of um, artistic expertise, gender um, representation, cultural diversity, stage of career. No two juries are ever the same. Occasionally, we repeat a juror. That could be because they have a specialized expertise and we could not find a new juror with that expertise. If you want to see a list of who our jury members have been, you'll find it on our website. Any questions on peer assessment? People familiar with that? Okay, S seeing none, as Councillor Riel always says. Okay, this is a, another really important one. When we invite a juror to sit on the jury, we uh, talk to them about conflict of interest. We send them a conflict of interest form that they have to review and they're not, their invitation to the jury is not final until they feel comfortable that they've been able to sign off a conflict of interest form. So the jury meets as a group, typically about two days overall, and they discuss each application and they score each application according to the published evaluation and assessment criteria. And then we can see the ranking of where um, all of the different applicants stand. And we do a number of processes towards the end. They don't know in the beginning how much money exactly is available because we want a really pure assessment of the quality of the applications. And then um, we ask them to take a look at the overall landscape and the final decisions that they've made. We always ask the juries to keep the discussion confidential because it can be really damaging to an artist's practice to hear something secondhand or thirdhand that a jury member might have said during the jury process. Um, and to pull out one or two words or phrases that have um, you know, been expressed through two really intensive days of discussion. And read the last couple of lines. I think I've gone over these pretty clearly. Thanks, Gabe. So here are the actual assessment criteria. They're actually put on a spreadsheet. The jurors have to read the app, all of the applications before they come to the table um, to discuss the jury. <clears throat> so in component one, they're pretty straightforward. The quality and clarity of the artist's statement, how, how you're able to express the program of activities that you want to undertake, the artistic merit of those activities, um, the value and impact of the project on the artist's practice. So because it's a development grant, the jury will be looking to see whether or not the things that you want to do, whether it's a workshop or travel or... Um, research, experimentation, exploration, how is it going to impact your practice and whether it's feasible? Are you going to actually be able to do what you've proposed with the amount of money available and with the time frame that you've proposed? They'll take a look at what your previous experience is and your support material to see if based on those things they think it's feasible that you'll be able to carry out the project. Any questions? Okay. Component two, very, very similar. 
This one, in this one, the project description is super important. It's more money. There's a good chance that you'll have other funders involved in this project. So the clarity and the quality of how you've been able to describe your project really matters. We're, we're going to do some tips and tricks at, at, at the very end, but never be shy to get somebody to help you with your application to help you to do an interview with you, to help you develop the project description, and definitely get somebody to look at the uh, application before you hand it in. The jury will be specifically asked to evaluate the artistic merit of the support materials and the program of activities. So Gabe is probably gonna um, tell you about how to hand in your support materials and what they should look like. And again, looking at the feasibility of the project, does the budget seem realistic? Does the artist's background indicate that they could definitely carry out the project as they've described it? Thanks, Gabe. Okay, Gabe, I think we're good to go. Uh oh. I may have lost him. Oh, there you are. Can we flip to the next slide? There we go. Inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. So this is, you know, a declarative phrase that we have in the um, application form and in the guidelines. And we just want to really sincerely be able to say to people in the community who are equity seeking groups that we are committed to supporting and promoting diverse artists and artistic practices. And if you um, are, you know, coming from a different cultural tradition, if your work is either contemporary within your cultural background or um, traditional within your cultural background, we will seek to put people on the juries who understand where your work and where you are coming from. We can accommodate deaf and hard of hearing artists. Um, we just need to know in advance. And <clears throat> any kind of um, members of marginalized religious, sexual orientation and gender identity groups, your work is very welcome. And again, we will seek to find jurors who will have the capacity to understand what kind of things you're doing and why you're doing them. Thank you. I think we're ready to go, Gabe. So the um, assessment committee, and the, in this case for grants to individual artists, it's a jury. And what we mean by that making that distinguish distinction between a jury and assessment committee, jury's decisions are final. Um, assessment committees are sometimes used to make a recommendation, like in the Poet Laureate program, they actually recommend a Poet Laureate that has to be approved by the city's um, Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. And sometimes we have review panels. But the really critical part of this um, slide, I guess, is that we try really hard to ensure that there's broad representation, skills and knowledge from these communities. And again, we've certainly adapted to, and helped people um, make um, a better application if you don't have access to a computer, if you have, um, you know, technological issues, particularly Gabe will we'll work with you. He is infamous for his um, courage and determination, particularly during COVID, to support artists who might not have access to the regular technologies that many people enjoy. And uh, we will do everything we can to make sure that your application gets completed and gets in front of the jury. Oh, and here it says the GFIA program coordinator, Gabe Pollock. So the actual application instructions are always available on our website. That is the link there. So Gabe, if you go to the website, you want to hit, and you want to hit, so I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, 
It's the grants, bursaries, and commissions bu button you would go to? Uh, yeah, you can access it from there. It's also on the slider on the main page as well. Or That's you can right. Access it from our social media. Okay. Yeah, so and, we've uh, just a reminder to make sure that you are using the correct application form. Uh, in previous years, we've all had it together on one form. Uh, here we've separated it out so you can download component one application form or component two application form, which hopefully will make it less confusing and not more. We will see. <laughs> it was a request from previous competitions. So any questions on how to find your application or what to do with it once you filled it out? You can email it directly. We don't accept physical mailed um, applications un unless it's an accessibility question. And I noticed that on this slide, supplementary documents is bolded. So I suspect we'll be getting into those next. The supplementary support material is really important because you can't count on the members of the jury knowing your work. Um, they may know it, they may be familiar with it, but your application and your support material has to be what convinces them to give you a grant. Thanks, Gabe. So we talked about making sure you use the correct application form. Both of the application forms have checklists. And we really encourage you to take a look at that checklist, either mentally or physically, go through every item and make sure you've completed that portion of the application form. So I'm just worried my cat's gonna jump up here and knock everything over. She's saying, I'd like to apply. You can pay me in treats. Yeah. Okay, so support materials are really critical. Um, we're going to recommend that you start by preparing your support materials. So if you're using video or if you're submitting a recording, if you're submitting um, a, a written text, do that first in case you have a glitch that you need to deal with. Pay attention to the requested format on the application form. And there is a specific moment in the jury process where the jury is asked specifically to evaluate the quality and the merit of your support materials. And you can provide up to five examples document documenting your previous work. And you see in this slide, which again will be available online, like all the information is in the program guidelines and also this entire presentation will be available on the website. And you can see the list. Gabe, do you want to say anything in particular ab about support materials? Um, nothing in particular. Uh, the only thing is that uh, the, the line I do like to give is that we're not uh, evaluating your technical expertise on this. So if, if you're struggling with this, if you're not certain, if you've got things uploaded, we always double check the support materials. Um, and you can feel free to email and just be like, did this attachment come through? Or can you look at this YouTube video or whatever? Is, uh, is my link working? Yeah, for sure. That That's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, that, that's about all. <clears throat> Just um, to be realistic, um, we, we talk about a certain number of minutes for video clips. You can hand in things that are longer. We find that juries, you know, they, they have a, they make up their minds fairly quickly and we allow them to determine how much of a video or a recording they want to experience. Thanks, Gabe, I think we can go on. See, Adele has her hand raised. Adele, oh, Adele. Question? Hi, thanks for that. Um, so, okay, so I'm a creative writer. I'm an author. Mm -hmm. And I would like to um, submit a project of short stories that I'm working on. And so I'm just wondering, I was thinking about submitting two short stories for consideration for my support. I just 
like, what is the length that you're looking for? I think if you're a short story writer, you can, you know, submit two short stories. We can't guarantee that the jury will read all of all of them. It'll depend on the length. But we will also send instructions to the jury when it's something like two short stories, really encouraging them to try and finish those two stories. We sometimes get a similar question when people are submitting film or scripts. Um, we really try to push the jury to read the entire mat material, but I think you're wise to choose two. The two that you think make the most sense in terms of your practice and the connection to the project you're applying for. And Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. I've got a question, Sue. Yes, hi, Peyton. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm I'm doing a, a project with uh, one other artist and it's a partner. So I guess we would fall under an ad hoc um, situation. It's me and Drita. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering for the support material, should we be sending support material just from one of us as the lead artist? Or should we be sending support material as a combo since the both of us are intending on, neither one of us is planning on leading the project, we're planning on doing it, devising it together. I think you're very wise to submit some support material from both artists if yeah. you're gonna be working in such a close partnership. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Can, can I ask, actually ask one more question about the support material? No. Just <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. Please do. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, I just, I was filling out the forms today and there is a description. How much um, that chart that's on there, how much of a, description or what are you looking for there in the description of the support materials mm -hmm. uh, probably not that that long um because they're going to be reading them but you could you know give a, a really short synopsis of the story and when it was written if you want to have a genre description you could put that in but really it's just so we nobody makes a mistake when they're looking at the support material that they know, okay, I'm supposed to be reading a short story here. That's the main yeah. thing. Okay, so even something just as basic as saying um, two short stories and the titles, that would work for the description. You don't need to get into the themes or... No, if you, okay. if you want to say a detective novel in the uh, you know, pan-African, African futurist tradition, you can, but you don't need to. Okay, so I great. just listened to something on the CBC about African futurism, so it's really on my mind. <laughs> that's not what I'm writing about, but it's that's okay, good. I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So those are absolute replicas of the checklists on the application forms. Be sure to go over them at the at the end before you submit everything. This is a pretty strict deadline. Gabe monitors it very closely. Okay, so this is a really specialized document that we have actually built over several years. Um, it was initially developed by Kate Story, who many of you will know as an actor, director, playwright, dancer, writer and choreographer in town. Um, it was part of a early multidisciplinary um, professional development workshop that EC3 offered. But every year that we learn something new or artist points out something to us or a jury member does, we add to it. So this tips and tricks list is really worth looking at. The photograph is actually from a, an art suite project uh, about this time last year. And you can see Sue Newman singing and Charlie Glasspool playing. And um, I forget what it was called. I can't believe I forget because I commissioned it. 
Isn't that awful? It was a big musical production up on Armor Hill. Okay, so really obvious things to some people, but not to other people. Check the deadline, start early. And this was Kate saying, start earlier, start now. Thanks, Gabe. I think this is Benj Roland, also at Arts Week. Read all the guidelines first, even though it's wordy and boring. Remember when you were in school and people would tell you, read the whole exam question, be questions, all of the test question before you start answering. Same with the guidelines. Make sure you read them all before you start completing the application. Thank you. Victoria Ye playing in Portrapalooza, I think. Really think about what the question is asking and try to imagine yourself as a juror. All the time you're writing, remember that you're trying to help the jury members understand your practice and understand this particular project. Be specific when you answer the questions. Avoid vague academic jargon. Thanks, Gabe. Oh, that was a great, uh, great Bollywood, new Bollywood group in Peterborough again during Arts Week last year. Be prepared to write many drafts. Save often. I think that's another one that came from Kate, who's had terrible experiences of getting three quarters of the way through a grant application and then losing it. Um, again, when you're doing the graphs, don't be shy or think that it's not legitimate to have somebody else look at the draft and make comments, suggestions, do editorial work. All of that is totally legitimate and can make for a much stronger application. We want you to be able to get the grant because you're a great artist with a great project proposal. And if you need help in the writing side, that's totally fine. Oh yes, the word the word counts. We do take the word counts seriously. You may have to do some wordsmithing and some editorial um, work to get that word count um, to the exact amount. We're EC three is a bit more generous, I think, than other funders with word counts, just because I'm a wordy writer. I think. <clears throat> This is Cassandra Cassandra Lee's part of a look out that was part of Arts Week last year. Yeah, be really clear and concise. Avoid jargon and art speak. I think sometimes, especially emerging artists, feel they have to use uh, fancier or more academic or critical language, and you don't. And especially if it doesn't come naturally to you or isn't part of your, your normal practice, be clear, concise, straightforward uh, writing is what will appeal to the jury and help them understand. Thanks, Gabe. I think this is a piece by Lester Alfonso that was part of um, Arts Week last year too. Get help, get feedback. I've mentioned that one already. And double check the checklist. Make sure to have someone proofread it. So. I have had experiences. I, I worked at the Canada Council for the Arts for a long time and uh, used to take artists with me across the country to do grant writing workshops. And um, all of the people that helped us with that had been jurors. And they said that they hated to say that spelling mistakes and typos could influence them. But the truth was somewhere psychologically they felt it did. So anything you can do to make sure it's a clean um, you know, well-written document will help your application. We don't want to tease you about that. Thanks, Gabe. Oh, that's Ziza and somebody. I'm not sure who the other person is. Is that Jen? I'm not sure. Anyway, that's the poetry cart at Arts Week. Try not to be afraid of the budget. Don't hesitate to check in with Gabe if you're not sure how to complete the budget. Be precise as the, your math teacher might have said to you, um, show your work. So, you know, really break out if you're going to involve other artists and you're going to pay them this much a day to work with you or this much of an artist's fee for this component of the project. Spell it out for the jury. 
why you have put that amount in and also let the jury know and let us know if there are other funders in the project, whether the um, funding is confirmed or not confirmed, and if not, whether it's likely to be confirmed before the jury meets. But be precise. If you need to, check out the potential costs, you know, call suppliers, just because you just don't want to get caught up in, in a situation where people on the jury are really, really experienced and they say that rental fee is ridiculous, that kind of thing. Thanks, Gabe. Oh, there, that was a good one. Don't pad your budget. Don't make false claims or promises. Don't underestimate on the other side of it, the time or resource requirements. Document your need. And by that, we mean you can speak in the application about your budget. Thanks, Gabe. Just in front of trail. Does your budget balance? Um, it's really important to put together a balanced budget. And by that, we mean where the revenues and the expenses are equal. Um, make sure that your budget matches your narrative. So if you say it's going to be, you know, a 40 minute independent film, then it will behoove you to put the real money down that it's gonna to cost to shoot that film, process that film, edit that film and uh, where you're going to get all the money to do that. That's Irish Millie. Again, double check for completeness and consistency. So if you talk at the beginning of the project about involving X number of artists, make sure they're accounted for in some way in your budget with artist fees or that you're going to, I'm because I was a media arts curator, all I can think about is like crane shots and things like that, but make sure that you're being really consistent. If you mention certain things that you think you're going to need to do or want to do as part of your project proposal, make sure your budget is consistent with what you're proposing. I have no idea who this is, isn't that awful? Yeah, make sure you're replying for the right component. So again, com oh, it says right there, Portuguese. <laughs> Um, make sure uh, component one, research, development, exploration, um, workshopping, anything that's sort of in the pre-production um, piece of the, of the artistic process is eligible under component one. Production, presentation, dissemination, um, those are all things that are eligible in, in component two. Any other questions? James? So I, I'm working with a, a writer mm -hmm. and we're going to work together to produce a series of works. I thought originally that I would, because it's a change of my practice, that I would be apply for part one. But we're at the point where I think we can go ahead. So and I'm being vague here. Um, w would it make more sense for me to apply for part two because we are going to go ahead with this? It's we're going to produce a body of work together. Okay. Yeah. Yes. What I'd suggest is that you call uh, call or email Gabe. I know it okay. can be awkward to describe the details when in, in a big <laughs> public session like this. And when you talk a little, or you can call me too, but really he's yeah. the, the expert at deciphering these things. Okay. Um, yeah, to really make make sure that you're at the point where a, a jury will see that you're production ready. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I think, surprisingly, I think we could be. Okay, great. I will email or call Gabe. I'll also note that in general, kind of as a as a general thing, there are people who have applied for component one in one year and the project gets to a point and then they apply for component two in the next year. Um, so that certainly is an option if if like you think over the next year you're going to be developing it and then you're going to move into production mode. 
uh, that's that's also a, a way to handle it as well. That might actually give me more time too, which is maybe sure. a good good thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, we're re we're really happy that we have been able to create component one. It was a normal part of Canada Council and OAC granting mm -hmm. for many many years, and it, it's really kind of faded. Everything is very project oriented, so we wanted to split them up and give people. Even time to fail. I mean, I would never say that in front of a city councilor, but, um, you know, exploration, trial and error, um, experimentation are all really valuable things to be part of com component one. Okay. Experimentation can certainly be part of comp component two. It can be edgy work or it can be conventional work. As we said, it can come from any tradition um, and the jury will will be multidisciplinary. So. Okay. okay, I think that's everything at our end. We're really thrilled to see you all here tonight. We really want to encourage your applications. We're proud that a city of 85,000 people cares enough about the arts to have funded and created this program and to have established an arts council to deliver it. So um, let's show them that um, people really need it and want it. And certainly, I just will say one more thing that I hope will encourage you. Particularly this year, we've had emails from artists that got grants from this program, completed a certain amount of work or a smaller project, and they were able to use that to leverage money from other arts councils like Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Chalmers Awards program, or the, um, oh, I can never remember what it's called, and they don't fund, they just quit funding individual artists, but the tourism program. So also remember that your grant can help you leverage money um, from other funders or sponsors. And that's very really exciting to see that happening, is that the smaller investments at the municipal level work to propel people forward and help them get funding at another level. Okay. Thank you all for coming tonight. Fortunately, the tornado held off. And uh, as they say, may the force be with you, tornado or otherwise. Take care. Don't hesitate to be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike.